Uh, I want to thank the organizers of Paideta. It's, uh, it's great to see these orange t-shirts and all the people that are making this a, a phenomenal. I came here in 2013, one of the first Paidetas. Uh, Numfolk has been, a, been dear to my heart from 2012 when we first started it, and I started talking with Leah about how do we organize Numfolk and really make it a community-centric event and, and organization, and Paideta has just exploded throughout the world with people like these fine people. who It's a community-based, community organization, and a lot of great things are happening. I've been part of the Python community for a long time, as they described, uh, definitely uh, 1997. I'm a Python enthusiast since 1997, as my slide show. Um, I've been really anxious about figuring out how to ensure that those who are using array-oriented computing in Python can continue to do that in an effective way as scalable computing, many core computing, uh, emerges on the scene. Um, and, and that's been, a, been driving me for the past four years, and I'm pretty excited to talk about some of the the things we've been doing that have actually come to fruition. And you can today do things that many people don't realize is possible. So I'm basically out trying to convince and show people that a lot of things they're doing today could be done better by using the tools that are now available in the Python ecosystem. Things like Numba, things like Bask. So I'm talking about scale up versus scale out. And how do we scale up is the idea of getting bigger boxes, uh, better computer, more memory, more machine, more CPUs on the computer. Scale out is about getting more computers. And they have different characteristics in terms of wanting to do different kinds of problems with both. Uh, the software you have to write in order to take advantage of each of these uh, scenarios is a little bit different. And of course, the best of both worlds we're really after. How do we actually have clusters of very powerful machines for the biggest problems? So the Python side of the ecosystem, it's actually a very detailed story. I could, I could spend two hours sort of telling you about the origins of this community. <laughs> Uh, it's very interesting, actually. I've been fortunate to be a part of it since 1997 and watching all the different folks. And definitely one thing I could say that's necessary for this to work is community. Uh, it is uh, the, the Pi data and the scientific computing story in Python is about many, many people. However, it is also about certain people who spend a lot of time working. I mean, Wes McKinney put a lot of effort into Pandas. John Hunter put a lot of effort into Matplotlib. It is not true that you just sort of throw the internet open and hope that occasional you know, pull requests emerge libraries. That's not really how it works. What works is somebody puts a lot of effort into creating something, and then people gather around that thing and then make it better. And it's that, and both of those are necessary. So I say that because you may have an idea, you may have something that you want to pull together, and you should. You should go pursue it. Go pursue something, build a, build, build a, a kernel, and then understand how it interacts and connects with the wider ecosystem in order to broaden the appeal and get many people using it together. So this scientific ecosystem, like I said, I've spent the first 15 years of my Python life uh, effectively uh, a developer and a practitioner using these tools. I started as a scientist, and that led me to build SciPy, that led me to uh, make NumPy, so it unified the worlds, uh, led me to kind of write some books, do some Python peps, become a Python core developer. A lot of time spent trying to make the foundations of this ecosystem uh, compatible. I plan to spend the next 15 years of my life basically ensuring that this ecosystem can scale both up and out, take advantage of GPUs, take advantage of multi-many core systems, the new Intel Phi uh, machines, making sure that they can take advantage of clusters of machines. And, and the same agile, interactive exploration made possible by the tools in Python today continue to be possible at scale. And you can have huge uh, systems. So this is a many-faceted effort, a lot about rallying community, creating unfocus, uh, encouraging the PyData ecosystem, uh, building the Anaconda as a distribution so that everybody can get the stuff really quickly. And then there's been a series of technologies we've been pursuing in Continuum Analytics to try to uh, fill in some gaps that we see. I mean, Conda is sort of the basic uh, Python packaging solution. If you're not using Anaconda or haven't, aren't fully taking advantage of Conda environments and shared environments, uh, you should take a look at Anaconda Cloud, take a look at what's possible, because a lot is possible that I suspect you're, that many of you may not be aware of today. Uh, then, of course, Numba, Dask, Dyn, Blaze, and a new thing, Data Fabric. I'm not going to go into detail about all this today. I'm going to talk about some of it, uh, but there's a lot more to do. In 2012, uh, we took off at Continuum, and the effort was to scale NumPy, NumPy make, make a next generation NumPy. That's what we said we wanted to do. That's what we started working on. Um, and Numba was the scale up, and Blaze was the scale out. And those are the major efforts. And in the process, we started working directly with NumPy, realized that, that that needed to be a maintained library, and it was hard to innovate on it quickly because just the status of it, it's a mature library. In 2013, I actually officially retired from maintaining NumPy. Maintaining NumPy. I'm still a big advocate of NumPy. I still know the code really well. I still understand exactly how it's built. Uh, but there's a, fortunately a very uh, other group of people who are helping maintain NumPy. So I want to make clear that I don't speak for NumPy and where it's headed. 
right? I definitely am, into, I mean, I, I'm just like any of you in that regard. I'm an individual who have ideas, and then in order for NumPy itself to move, that community of people who are making NumPy move would move it forward. My efforts are not so much a single library, but a collection of capabilities with an emphasis on scale. And it's definitely a community effort. I'm gonna speak today about uh, work. I don't do this work all myself. I'm gonna speak about work that's been done by Continuum primarily, people at Continuum, some great developers who have joined me and joined my co-founder Peter at Continuum in order to produce these technologies. So, so I'm not gonna be able to have time or detail to go through all their names and show all their pictures. I would at some future point, but recognize that it's a big community. Beyond what we're doing at Continuum, of course, the entire ecosystem around Python for Data Science is also growing. You're, it's evidenced here by all the people here and the talks here. There's a lot of things happening, and it's very exciting to see. And that was actually one of the intentional things that when we started in 2012, we did. We organized a PyData event at Googleplex in 2012. That's actually where the origins of Conda came from when Guido said, hey, you're gonna have to write your own package manager because I don't care. <laughs> and so we did, right? We took him at his word. Um, and, that, and then. But PyData has grown. It's when, in 2012, is when uh, I, I managed to find Leah, put her as the executive director of NumFocus, organized NumFocus with Fernando and John Hunter and David Perry, excuse me, Perry Greenfield and uh, uh, Jared Millman. And that organization has now taken off. I just advise it now, and I don't spend a whole lot of time. <laughs> so, uh, but I love to see the growth that has taken place in that organization and around the world as the PyData community has come together. That's very, very exciting. Uh, NumFocus is basically Apache for Open Data Science. Uh, you had a great introduction from uh, James Powell there about it. James has been quite in, uh, uh, a, a, a super volunteer, I would say, in the NumFocus and PyData ecosystem. He's sort of been there all the time and really helping. Like, it's amazing. The guy doesn't sleep or he doesn't, I don't know what he does, but it's amazing all the things he does uh, to try to grow the community and to try to make sure that these kind of events can take place. Of course, I needed to go organize a company as well. I actually have six children. Uh, they are getting more expensive every day. And <laughs> three in college today, and as much as I love to spend all my days hacking out open source software, I still actually have to get paid somehow. My wife keeps wondering when I'm actually gonna bring home any money. Um, so I, I, I have to have to say, no, it's, it's gonna work somehow, sweetheart, eventually, believe me. Somebody will pay me eventually. Uh, so we have to work on, a, on, we have to create a company, and I'm actually a big believer in markets. I actually believe companies are a key way that you give people what they need. And there's different needs, there's different desires from a, a community base, what community's gonna build, and what a company can build to ensure that the open source software works well at scale in production in a company, works with their, integrates with their uh, security systems and all those things. Our purpose of Continuum is to empower people to solve the world's greatest challenges. It is, and, and that is definitely, we take that seriously, and I love it when I see the tools that I've been working on for years show up in the, uh, to find gravitational waves. I can't, that was a very amazing thing this past year. I, I felt very, very proud that people were, that SciPy Signal was involved in finding some of those tools. <laughs> SciPy Signal was the very first module, extension module I wrote for uh, SciPy as a grad student at the Mayo Clinic. So I was very excited to see that. As we help people discover, analyze, and collaborate by connecting curiosity and their experience with any data. That's a broad goal, but we're accomplishing that with a, on a number of fronts. We started working on key technologies with a lot of help from XData, the a DARPA funded program to help us, in order for us to work on technology, we gotta have f funding from somewhere. Some of that funding comes from our profits from consulting and by companies funding it directly. Some of that comes from uh, uh, XData or other governmental agencies giving us grants in order to, to work on this. And we hope that someday some of it will come from uh, profits from product sales, but that's still a work in progress and we're still hoping that'll happen. Um, start with, with the key technologies we're building are things like Blaze, Bokeh, Numba. Blaze, uh, basically was a, was a big project, big problem, and it, and it factored off a ton of activity. And now I'm gonna talk today about how Dask is emerging as the way to do parallel NumPy and Pandas style computing, which is ext extremely exciting. Uh, create a platform, Anaconda is free and open source. Just go click on it, download it, get everything you need in one easy install. It's an open data science platform, powered by Python, fastest growing open data science language. Uh, it, it does a lot of things to help you get insights from data more quickly and more robustly and faster. Uh, this is the obligatory architecture diagram. It just illustrates Anaconda is intended to be full featured, to basically uh, be a solution for DevOps, data engineers, developers, data scientists, and business analysts, bringing them all together and work together as a team to work on top of all the data, all the libraries, uh, and integrate governance, provenance, and security issues. The free foundation provides a huge amount of this and then we have some subscriptions on top that deliver the rest for a company. One thing I wanted to make clear, everyone should understand that Free Anaconda now has a very interesting feature in which it comes with MKL libraries by default. So the Intel MKL libraries 
Now, some of you may know that Anaconda is BSD. That means you can take it, include it in your stuff, redistribute it, you don't have to get permission. And that includes the MKL libraries that are now included with, MKL, with, with Anaconda. So this is the easiest way to actually get Anaconda and redistribute your application with MKL attached. We have special permission from Intel to do this. So it's a great way to get fast performant libraries and connect them to your application. It's been since version 2.5, which was released in January of this year. And these provide optimal performance uh, for SciPy, for NumExpr, and for uh, NumPy on the linear algebra tools. I also wanted to make sure and uh, thank and encourage people to check out ConduForge. ConduForge is an amazing community-led uh, Conda package channel. So if you haven't, if you're not familiar with the Conda Packager, Conda is a package manager for OS X, Mac, and Linux that gives you the ability to create new environments easily with all the dependencies you need uh, for the software you're distributing and running and playing with. So gone are the days where you have to spend hours and years <laughs> to try to build your, your Python environment and then panic when it disappears. Like I, sh I, I delete and remove Conda environments all the time because I can quickly get back to them. And so Conda Forge, it's a community-led builder of Conda packages. They have some automated tools to build and test recipes. It's extremely awesome. You basically can add, you can install packages from there using the dash C Conda Forge. And you saw a few people showing you that in, to, in today's uh, demos. Really what the intent is to make sure that no demo at PyData is not re reproducible. Everybody who gives a demo, if they have Conda package for what they're doing, can instantly provide you with an environment with everything you need to make that demo work, no matter who you are. It, it isn't, well, here's the code, hopefully your compiler works and it, and it works on your system. No, it's, here's the binaries, it can work every time, easily, reproducibly. Um, you can add the channel Conda to your config, now every time you Conda install, it's gonna look for, on that channel for packages as well. It is community-led. One of the differences between the Anaconda channel from Continuum is basically it's our tested channel. We are definitely working in concert with that community channel. We'd love to eventually have all of the Anaconda packages basically be just a tested set of the community packages and have the community package be a very, very rapid place where things can emerge very, very quickly. That's my ideal. In 2012, at PyData in New York City, we promised that we were gonna work on parallel pandas and parallel NumPy. That's what we were working on. And some people mistook our enthusiasm for, hey, we got something working already. <laughs> that was not the intent. It was a developer-led conference where it was like, hey, we're working on some things. Who wants to join us? And that was the whole intent to describe it. I'm here today to talk. We have some stuff working, and it's really cool. You ought to use it. <laughs> so it's different today. And, uh, but we introduced them early. We're now ready to rally a user community around these tools because it's absolutely ready for prime time. So the eagle has landed. And milestone success in 2016, Numba is delivering on scale out, on scale, uh, scale, up, uh, scale up, actually. I've got these backwards. Oh, how embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Numba is delivering on scale up, and Dask is delivering on scale out. And that's happening today. So it's very exciting, and I'll, you'll, you'll, I know that Numba's familiar to some. You'll learn more about it from Graham later, and Dask is familiar probably to just a few. And uh, we'll talk more about that today. To give you a little preview of what's possible, if you combine Numba and Dask, you get the best of both worlds, scaled up, scaled out. You have clusters of fast machines able to do amazing things, like sub-second rendering of three billion points in a browser, backed by big enough machines to do it. So this is OpenStreetMap data connected with something called the uh, Data Shader, which is an open source package connected with the Bokeh project that lets you just take extremely large data and look at it and look at it in a visually percept a perceptually accurate way that avoids some of the oversampling and the, and the binning problems that occur if you just put a scatter plot in matplotlib or something for millions of points. It's an exciting um, innovation made possible by the combination of Dask and Numba. So it's a great example of kind of pulling these together in order to produce amazing solutions quickly. Just another example of data shader working now on the census data uh, with categorical data showing up as colors. You can do this for kind of any kind of data set, show it easily on a map, but do the computation necessary to do the aggregations quickly at scale. And uh, so just, just basically to show you that it's possible. Now the other thing I'm excited about, and I'm just gonna touch on it barely and briefly, if you're interested in understanding this more, come talk to us, come talk to me. I can help you understand how you today can take advantage of Numba and Dask inside of your Hadoop ecosystem, your Hadoop cluster. When I first started in 2012, one of the reasons we started Continuum was to solve this problem of an ecosystem that was adopting Hadoop rapidly with what I consider to be substandard execution environments. And certainly MapReduce was way substandard. Spark has come along and improved that situation, but I think it's still not what is possible for the Python ecosystem. And so we are uh, happy that we've We've always been able to, with Anaconda, connect through and use Spark and talk to Spark, 
There's lots of people here using PySpark and leveraging R and Python with Spark. And that's kind of Anaconda beside Hadoop. That's kind of Anaconda outside, then you can do graphs, you can do bokeh visualizations, you can do matplotlib and every other thing outside of it. What's exciting today is we can actually talk directly to HDFS, HDF's data without the JVM. So get rid of the JVM, have your data in Hadoop, talk to it through HDFS, use schedule resources with Yarn, but now your execution is all done with Python, all with Anaconda, and then the whole breadth of parallel ecosystem that's available to you, IPython Parallel, MPI tools, everything. Of course, Dask is now available as well, so you can do the same kinds of thing you're used to, um, but now, with Anaconda, and the, our early results show, I mean, it can be, it depends on what you're doing as whether it's faster or not. And it can be, you know, basically the same speed if you're not really using, leveraging the native machine code that is made possible by leveraging Anaconda. But if you are doing array computing, uh, linear algebra kinds of operations, you can get 10 to 100 times faster than Spark, than, than PySpark. And you can interact with the data nat natively, distributed computations without JVM, without serialization, without some of the trouble that happens with having to have JVM memory and Python memory and figure out which, which one is which. Uh, very exciting stuff. That's one of the reasons I'm here, is I really want to make sure people understand that this is possible today, and uh, it's open source, and the tools work together. Now, some may ask what happened to Blaze. Well, it's still going strong, actually. It's just refocused in a different place in the stack. Uh, it's sometimes a description of an ecosystem as well. So I'm going to start by telling you exactly where Blaze fits. And we'll run through this pretty quickly because I don't have a lot of time. The point of Blaze is to, is to allow the separation of expressions, metadata, and runtime. So expressions are the kinds of operations you want to do. And today, the challenge exists that if you want to do data science, the first question you have to ask yourself is, where is my data? Because if it's in a SQL database, or if it's in Hadoop, or if it's in a bunch of flat files, the code you write is quite different. It's quite different, and that's unfortunate. It's like we're back in the 60s for systems programmers, when people had to write different kinds of machine code because there wasn't a single way to express uh, computing. And of course, Fortran and C fixed that. Blaze is a layer on top, similar to what SQL tries, is trying to do, but allowing for advanced analytics where SQL is not quite enough. So Blaze gives you the ability to write high-level expressions and it backends to different backends. So I'm gonna talk more about Dask and Numba and how those backends are enabling Python to be a first-class citizen in the otherwise JVM-dominated scale-out solution story. Uh, but Blaze can talk to Spark, Blaze can talk to Impala, Blaze can talk to whatever database solu solution you choose. Uh, and it relies on something called DataShape. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip through these quickly so I can talk more about some of the other tools. But I wanna mention that DataShape is an important data declaration innovation. Uh, Dyn, which you'll, you can hear about from Irwin, he'll speak later just after this session, I believe, uh, definitely encourage you to go listen to him, um, uses this as a low-level description of data. It's a generalization of the NumPy D-type, but allows for all kinds of data, structured array, arrays of structures, um, the kinds of data that is common. And then there's a Blaze server component, and then the Blaze client. So basically, the Bla Blaze allows you to talk, write your expressions, and have an arbitrary backend compute them. It's still a work in progress, so I'm not here to announce that Blaze is ready for prime time. Jump on board. If you're interested in Blaze, I'm very interested in having you work up with Blaze, but, but come talk with somebody who's using Blaze. It requires still a little bit of hand-holding to make it work right for you. The other projects I'm going to talk about, Numba and Dask, are ready for you to try out. Ready, they still are open source projects, ready for contributors, ready for bug reports, but they're definitely ready for use. Um, data Fabric, this is more in the line of alpha demoware. Hey, it's the newest thing. If you're interested in working on this, come talk to me. I'm very excited about this. This, to me, is the culmination of the effort I started in 1998 with SciPy. It's trying to make a system that allows all kinds of languages to adapt to all kinds of data, leveraging data shape. And we've been working on some of the foundations here. I'm gonna give you a brief overview of Numba. If you want more, go, talk to, go, go see Graham Markle's talk. I'm gonna go rapidly go through these slides so you can just get a taste of what's possible if you're not familiar. And I'll slow down a little bit as I go through a particular demo that I wanna make sure you understand. So Numba is very easy to use. You put a JIT decorator around your code and assuming that it can understand all the types in your code, and all those types are arrays or scalars and not crazy things like dictionaries of uh, sets of arbitrary objects then it will speed that up and write native machine code out of it. And if you do that, then you get incredible speed ups. Speed ups including GPU speed ups of 2000x. Now you look at those and go, holy cow, 2000x? Yes, you can absolutely take your Python code and make it uh, 2000x faster. Definitely seen that in practice, seen that in production. Uh, in some cases, if you've written your Python code particularly badly, which is unfortunately more common than not, <laughs> you can actually get 100,000x speed up. 
So we have cases where that's been, been true. So um, I can't say that all of that is because of our optimizations, though. Some of that is just because of people not writing very good Python to begin with. <laughs> um, so how does Numba work? It takes your code. Know how easy it was, just a JIT on top of your code. Well, how does that work? Well, it actually waits to compile it until it gets called. Because at that point, it knows what you're calling it with, and all the types of information can, be, can flow through, and the lowering can take place. Um, it uh, doesn't require a C, C++ compiler. It is a compiler. Uh, it doesn't replace standard Python interpreter, unlike some other approaches. So it uses all your libraries, and it's ready to play alongside with the NumPy and the PyData stack. The typical way to use it is to a hotspot profile. So really, to use Numba effectively, you've got to be good at profiling. Find the place your code is wrong, or not wrong, but slow. <laughs> and uh, try to make it uh, faster with number JIT or number vectorize. I'm going to skip this one, which is filter and array. Shows you how you can be faster than NumPy by 2.7, 2 just by even more, sometimes 9x. I'm going to skip it so I can focus my attention on number around the number vectorize concept and show you, an, and this is an underappreciated concept, I think. Inside of NumPy is a powerful abstraction called the ufunc. Who knows what ufuncs and generalized ufuncs are? Let me say that. Actually, who knows what a generalized ufunc is? Raise your hand if you know what a generalized ufunc is. Okay, that's what I thought. About three people, right? <laughs> that's unfortunate because generalized ufuncs, basically, when used correctly, can reproduce all of NumPy or most of NumPy. That's a hypothesis, not a proof statement. So, uh, but you can certainly reproduce a ton of stuff uh, from somebody who wrote a lot of SciPy, especially uh, a lot, you know, SciPy as it was in 2001, and somebody who wrote a lot of NumPy as it was in 2006. All of that, I would say 90% of that, could have been rep replicated with what the techniques I'm going to show you right now. So that means you can unlock the inner secrets of NumPy by using NumPy vectori Numba vectorize and by understanding the concept of generalized ufunc. A generalized ufunc is an abstraction. Let's start with a ufunc. A ufunc is a you write a kernel that takes scalar inputs and returns scalar outputs, and then you apply that kernel to all the elements of an array. Very straightforward. It's like a map. But that kernel is now compiled code. So it's the same thing you do like in pandas, you have that a pandas apply, and you apply a kernel across a bunch of a, 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 a series. Well, if that kernel is compiled code, it's lightning fast. Now the problem is in pandas, it's not always, it's not always uh, a fast kernel. I'm trying to figure out how to fix that so to connect it to something fast, uh, very possible. Generalized ufunks take that a step further, and now your kernels can take a little arrays and produce other arrays. So now you can basically have kernels arrays, taking arrays, producing other arrays, and now you can map that across huge numbers of computing. That is at the heart of array-oriented computing. And if you apply array-oriented computing, you can get scale, both scale up and scale out, because it paralyzes very naturally. If you kind of think in ufuncs and generalized ufuncs, your code will be faster long term. So here's a very simple uh, example and demo of how would I make a windowed compute filter. So it's a very common expression, very common need. I have a bunch of data, and I want to take sub-regions of that data to produce an output. And I want to do that kind of in a shifted way across the whole, the whole length of, an, uh, of a vector. So these little, these little uh, bubbles here show I'm kind of taking groups of five in this particular case and returning a result based on those groups of five. Now, how would I do that? Well, if it's a linear filter, there actually is a FIR and SciPy Signal L filter and MP Convolve. There's already tools to do this if, if it's just a linear filtering. So the example I'm going to show, you can also just call a function in, in SciPy or NumPy to do it. But what if you're, it's nonlinear? You want to do some crazy computation or do some crazy things that's just not possible. How do I do that? Well, there's two approaches, basically. And this sort of, I, I show these two approaches to illustrate how using a generalized ufunc can help you. On the, on the left-hand side, you see this is using Numba to basically just write a nested for loop. Now, you'd never do a nested for loop in NumPy without jitting because it's going to be really slow. But with jitting, it turns out it's really fast. It's just like you wrote Fortran code. looks very similar. And so you can, get, you can write this code just like this and make it really fast. So here I'm taking an input and a length of the window, and I'm looping over the larger, in, the larger window, excuse me, the whole array I'm looping over in the first outer loop indexed by k. On the inner loop is where I'm doing the average of the five elements, or the uh, nw elements. Just computing the sum, dividing by the average, and storing it away. So I, I literally put this example together in about 15 minutes. Uh, and that was including the stride tricks effort to try to figure out how to do that as a generalized ufunc. So the, the, the normal case is easy, hand-coded implementation, and it's actually pretty fast. But if you take advantage of thinking about, well, let me see, how do I actually take a 1D array and pretend it's a 2D array? Well, there's this little funny function called stride tricks. And if you don't learn anything else today, this is sort of advanced knowledge. You can come and take away, hey, I, the author of NumPy showed me this really cool thing. Right? Can, if I change the strides of my array, 
And who knows what strides are? Raise your hand. Okay, those who don't know what strides are, strides is how NumPy knows about multiple dimensions. What makes it something a two-dimensional array? Because in memory, it's just one linear index of, of data. Right? NumPy knows about dimensions because it has a byte offset. It knows that to go in this dimension, I just simply skip by a certain number of bytes. So that's, that's how multidimensional arrays work in NumPy. It's very straightforward, very simple. What that means is I can fake a two-dimensional array. I can take my 1D array and fake a two-dimensional array where the second dimension is, is shifted offsets. Right? So I just take this 100-length array and make a 98 by 3 array, right? which is the starting point, and then the, three, the, and the, the, the length NW windows, which might be 3, might be 5, 7, 20, whatever, whatever your window length is. So that's what that stride tricks is doing. And you do it by simply copying the stride. To jump into the next dimension, I just go the same number of bytes as I go to go into this in the, in the first dimension. So um, now I have a two-dimensional array, but I didn't copy any data. It's just one dimension of data. I've just faked NumPy into thinking it was a 2D array. And now I can apply a generalized ufunc and write my kernel that takes a small window of data. The kernel now takes just this tiny little five vectors. That's the input of the kernel. And do something with them. And then the, when I call the generalized ufunc with this average kernel function here in the right-hand side, it's calling an, uh, basically the NumPy machinery that does the outer loop, and all I'm implementing for the kernel is that inner loop in the full implementation. So you can see, you can compare the left-hand side and the right-hand side, the average kernel that I'm, I'm vectorizing is simply the implementation of the inner loop. Now the generalized ufunc, tell, I, I tell it, okay, the input is a float eight vector, one-dimensional array, that's what that string syntax means, F8, bracket colon, means it's an array. And the, the signature is I take an n-length array and I return a scalar. The nuance here is that to describe a scalar output, you actually have to tell it it's an array output so you can access the, uh, the element. It's a little bit of a wart. I think it might have been changed, but, this is, but, but I didn't have time to test that. Um, so that's a generalized ufunc. You can apply generalized ufuncs. It makes it really trivially easy to take a 1D array and provide, use GU, uh, GU vectorize. We'll now compile that to machine code. And if you test these two implementations out, the full implementation, hand-coded, is actually faster for smaller arrays, like the 100 to 200, 500 elements. For bigger arrays, the scalable array-oriented solution is faster. And the advantage of the generalized U, the GU vectorize approach is now it can run on GPUs by target equals GPU. It can run on many cores by target equals parallel. And now I have access to my full machine. Very important to understand, with very simple code, you can have access to your entire machine, your full, comp your, your full capability set. That's on a single box. Of course, the output is a filtered version, just a simple average. Other interesting things, I'm going to skip forward because I don't have a lot of time and uh, show you Dask because I'm super excited to make sure that everybody here who is thinking, who is using PySpark, try Dask. If you're thinking about using PySpark, try Dask. I'm not saying that Spark won't, won't solve another problem for you, but I'm saying that a lot of the problems you're, you're trying to solve with Spark right now, I think are better solved with Dask. Uh, obviously, these are two different systems, and because of that, they have different solution spaces. And, if, and you can actually, there are cases where you can use them together to solve even bigger problems. Uh, so that's a kind of, it's a very exciting addition to the space, to the PyData ecosystem. Now, before I say that, it's important, before you go, show, go buy a bunch of machines and try to paralyze your system, <laughs> use a better algorithm. <laughs> Improve your actual single machine performance, maybe buy a bigger box. There's a lot of things, you know, subsample your data. There's a lot of reasons to sort of not, because it is harder. There's more effort, there's more work. Even with, with Dask, we tried to make it simpler, but it still is harder. Overview of Dask. So Dask is a parallel Python computing library. It's familiar. It implements and leverages NumPy and Pandas ecosystems. So with Dask, we can already do data frames, because we're using Pandas to do the actual computation. We can already do array computing. We're using NumPy to do the computation. You can take advantage of Dyned instantly as it comes online. It's flexible. It has sophisticated and messy algorithms. It builds a graph. It scales out, runs resiliently on clusters to hundreds of machines, scales down, it gets pragmatic to use even on a single laptop with many cores. It's interactive. One of the things that you can actually, it's really fun to sit in, with a, it's in front of a terminal and have hundreds of machines at your disposal. And basically, it's as if it's a single pandas data frame. When in reality, it's sitting across, all those data are sitting across tens and hundreds of machines. So it gives you interactive access to kind of pandas-like, NumPy-like experiences, but on a cluster. Very excited about Dask. It complements the rest of Anaconda. We've been working on it for four years. We've been working on it 
Uh, it's basically emerged as the latest innovation out of the Blaze ecosystem. And uh, it's, it's delivering on the promise we made four years ago. It fits here in the spectrum, and there's a lot of talks online. I'm not gonna be able to go into detail about Dask. I kind of just wanna emphasize that it's there, available for you to use. You should definitely try it out. High level how it works. One of the things that's beautiful about Dask, it's a very scalable solution, and it has an ecosystem of tools that can be built around it. So the key part is what you're building with Dask is a dictionary implementation of a directed graph of tasks. And those tasks can be arbitrary Python code. And, what, and if those tasks are basically chunks of NumPy functions or chunks of Pandas functions, that's how the array, that's how the data frame is implemented. You basically don't worry about the chunking. Dask, the collection, the Dask array takes care of that for you and you just pretend you have a big old array or a big old data frame. But behind the scenes, it's creating this directed graph of tasks. Now that hands off to a scheduler and each of these are orthogonal. So you can basically take, a, take and write your own scheduler if you want. If you don't like the uh, reference schedulers that are come with Dask, you can build your own or connect it with your own fancy scheduler capability and take the, just take the representation of the parallel program that Dask has given you in the directed graph. It's a very, very powerful system, very flexible, very, very capable. Um, here's just the collections. You have the Dask array on which you can do NumPy-like expressions. You have a Dask data frame on which you can use data frame-like expressions, group bys and, and means. And then the bag is probably the closest, th like the RDD is a, uh, Dask subsumes the concepts of the RDD. Uh, and the bag is, is, is basically a simpler Python list. It's like a generic distributed list and you can do a bunch of things with it. And the imperative is the concept of just taking arbitrary functions and putting a delayed in front of them. And just adding, and using this to build up an arbitrary expression graph. You, if for the, the array or the data frame doesn't quite compute or complete the computation you're looking for. So every kind of thing you're doing, maybe you're doing cross-validation on a scikit-learn system. Ultimately, that becomes a machine learning pipeline. This is like a machine learning pipeline. And if you want to do this in parallel, you have a bunch of machine learning pipelines with different parameters. And it creates a bigger graph. And that's fine. You just throw that bigger graph to Dask, and off it goes. And, and, it and, the, and, the, distribute, and the schedulers, and there are three different schedulers. Um, synchronous, that's actually just a test scheduler. It's actually, don't do this in parallel, just check because parallel debugging is really hard. <laughs> and make sure I'm actually doing what I think I'm doing. The threaded and the multiprocessing schedulers are intended for single node to take advantage of all your cores rapidly. And then distributed is the exciting new scheduler that allows you to take advantage of hundreds of machines and do a task problem on a bunch of nodes. So the graphs themselves can be arbitrary. Uh, this shows you how you might build a graph from a simple array expression, a plus one times two raised to the third power. All of those different lines, independent parallel lines, are chunks of the array, and you're operating on them independently. But they can get more complicated than that. Here's an example where you have a mean, then you can calculate your standard deviation, so it comes back around, and that directed graph is a bit more complicated, so the scheduler has to do a little more work to make sure that the data that ne it needs to do another task is available for that task, before that task runs. And the distributed scheduler, I won't go into the details there, we don't have a lot of time, um, but basically the idea of the distributed scheduler is I have a client machine talking to a scheduler. All I have to do is run something called dworker on all my nodes. And there's ways to do that, integrate with Yarn, so Yarn can fire up the dworker on every node. Uh, you can allocate the resources. Then you run descheduler on one node, and that's your a context, effectively. That's where you go, and then you, you run your expressions. And the scheduler communicates out to the workers so that they do the right work. The return, what, uh, it's data aware, data local aware. The scheduler is resilient, the scheduler is elastic, the scheduler is local, local, data local aware. Uh, as long as you read data with, you have to write, you have to make sure you're reading the data in a way that's, um, if you just have one node reading all the data and try to make Dask work with that, it's not gonna be parallel. But if, if you actually read, have your, work, your pipeline read data from all the nodes, and there's an HDFS library and an S3FS library inside of distribu the distributed scheduler to make that easy for you, to show you how that's done. But it's easy to, to extend and to keep working with. On a cluster, the decluster command actually automates the schedule, running the scheduler and the workers on all the nodes. Uh, there's resource management integration with Yarn. That's a project called NIT. Uh, that's on, uh, that's part of the Dask GitHub organization. Because Dask is basically ready to fly off on its own to become its own project, it now has its own GitHub organization called Dask. It sort of was spawned and incubated in the Blaze ecosystem, and now it's its own Dask GitHub organization. And that's where NIT and HGFS and the Dask capabilities are living. There's also a project called DEC2. 
what that does is, is it's very, very easy to spend a lot of money on Amazon. <laughs> Basically, you can, with that one command, spin up tens and dozens and hundreds of nodes on Amazon machines and put Dask and the Anaconda uh, stack on all of them. And then basically instantly have this beautiful cluster machine ready at your fingertips to work through your Jupyter notebook and, and, and load data from um, and, and go to town. Uh, if you are um, interested in more robust enterprise versions of this, this is where the pitch from Continuum comes. We do have a product called Anaconda Cluster that makes this even easier. Uh, and come talk to us if you'd like to do this at scale in your enterprise and connect with uh, parcels from Cloudera or connect with Stacks from Hadoop or do, uh, from Hortonworks, excuse me, or do uh, integrate with your current system. There's a, in, there's a visualization tool that's built in, so you can actually visualize and see what's happening with your cluster, all the machines that are running, the processes that are running. It's a very nice example of the Bokeh visualization. Bokeh is another fantastic project. I'm not gonna, have to, I'm not gonna talk about it except for this one slide. <laughs> but it, it, what I'll say is the, uh, Matt Rockland did a lot of work with Dask. In an afternoon, he was able to take Bokeh and build this. That shows how easy it is used to build a working interactive web visualization tool with Bokeh today. Uh, he was not a web visualization expert nor a uh, JavaScript guy, but he was able to produce this pretty quickly. So lots of examples, there's webinars online. I just wanna kind of provide a little more pictures to see how Dask is a logical collection of chunks. And so you can take basically a bunch of data that might exist independently as pandas data frames. What Dask does is collect them all together so you can operate on them as one logical data frame. And it takes care of the distribution and the, and the scaling. Uh, you can do s very complicated things to do text data if you just use the bag interface. The Dask array you know, takes little chunks of NumPy arrays and makes a logical large-scale large array. And then Dask delayed lets you do custom workflows. Basically anything you like is possible. So in conclusion, uh, basically I'm here to tell you that Python does scale. And it scales beautifully. And it scales without the JVM. And it scales allowing you to take advantage of all the great tools, the scikit-learns, the innovation that's going to continue as I look at this conference and I see the wonderful talks that are, that are here. Innovation is continuing, and it will continue. And with Numba and Dask, you can get the fastest code you need out of your machine for the hardware you have. You don't have to turn to CUDA. You don't have to turn to C. You don't have to turn to Fortran. And you can get scale-out solution as well. You don't have to turn to the JVM. You don't have to turn to the other solutions. Now, you can use those other solutions still. Python integrates beautifully with whatever you like. So it's not that they're off limits. You can absolutely use them, <laughs> but you don't have to. And so that lets you use them appropriately when you really need them and not because there just wasn't another interface that Python had. So that's very exciting. And uh, please contribute to the next stage of the journey. So I said we landed on the moon, so to speak, <laughs> but we're really trying to colonize Mars. So there's a lot of work still left to do. <laughs> and a lot of people can, a lot of need for people to jump in and contribute around the NumFocus ecosystem, around the PyData ecosystem, uh, or specifically around the projects that I described. Uh, so thank you very much. It's been a pleasure, privilege to be here. I'll take questions. <laughs> we have about five minutes for yeah, questions. Thank you very much, Travis. <laughs> that was a lovely keynote. We'll just take the questions in one second. Um, point of admin, the speakers for the next rooms, Christian, Erwin, and Luke, could you go on to your rooms, please, and get set up so we can smoothly go over 10 o'clock to the next talks? So just those uh, speakers to leave the room, please. Um, and then, yeah, over to questions, bits of questions. Uh, thanks very much, Travis. That's an interesting overview. Um, can you talk a little bit about Conda Forge? Because Wes McKinney is saying it's like pa Python's uh, red hat moment of like to enable enterprise-ready kind of uh, technologies and communi community-driven enterprise-level adoption of uh, Python. Could you talk a little bit about, about yeah, that? Yeah, so I'm not sure what has all been said in that regard, so I haven't read the blog oh. you're referring to, so I don't know if, um, I can say that, so Anaconda has been enterprise-ready for a long time, actually. <laughs> uh, what, what's needed, though, is a way to connect the, the community energy in a way that makes it fast, to go from community activity to enterprise deployment. And that's really what Conda Forge, I think, is allowing. Because effectively, it's un unblocking the bottleneck of having just a few people building Conda packages and making it possible for an ecosystem of people to build Conda packages uh, around a common build system, right? a common build, build core. Uh, but the enterprise delivery of that is actually a separate question, you know, making that reproducible and making that um, reliable and, and supported and indemnified. That's a separate question. I don't know if that helps. 
But it's one reason I'm really eager. I've, I've all, with Conda, we always, we made it open source, we made it BSD licensed precisely to let people build Conda packages however they like. But it's really important to have a kind of a uniform way to do it so that you don't have all this fracturing that's going on currently in the Python ecosystem for binaries. Other question? Yeah, Stephen. Can you um, say a bit about the relationship between uh, Data Fabric and uh, Arrow and Feather? Yeah, Data Fabric is a generalization of Arrow. I love Arrow, the idea, but it's like a very small piece of the general concept that I'm pursuing with Data Fabric. So you can imagine uh, Arrow uh, provides like one kind of data shape, or maybe a family of data shapes. So it's a good idea, but I just want to make it more general. I realize you just talked to us about giving us <coughs> incredibly precise tools um, with Dask and so on, but are there any plans to overlay SQL over the top? Yeah, so that's actually where Blaze fits in. Um, so Blaze uh, already can, you can basically transform to SQL on top, but maybe you're looking for, is there a SQL translation to a Dask engine? Um, there aren't current plans for that. You could certainly build an Impala-like thing on top of Dask, right? Uh, we um, are instead uh, using Blaze as kind of the interface. Because uh, a lot of people, especially for advanced analytics who we're targeting, it, uh, would prefer to write Python expressions. There are there's people who would love to write SQL as well, but they sort of already have tools for that. They can run SQL on top of Hive, they can run SQL on top of, of uh, Spark. The problem is, I guess, maybe you want it faster, and maybe Dask interface <laughs> can be faster. It's a good idea. Uh, I think that's sort of a down the road roadmap piece for us. Uh, if others would like to take that on, I think that's an awesome project. <laughs> A SQL interface on top of Dask would be beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, uh, you men mentioned briefly about um, installing Parcel for uh, Clouded and Hortonworks cluster. Yes. Uh, Hortonworks is, is called Stacks. They're not called Parcels, but yes. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, explain in detail how it's done? No. Uh, so we have Parcels available for Anaconda. Okay. So Anaconda comes in a Parcel. It's really a static. One of the problems with Parcels is they're sort of a static deployment. Many people like that. Uh, with the tools we have in our enterprise offering, you can create parcels quickly. Oh, so it's, uh, it's part of your enterprise? Yeah, it's part of our enterprise. Oh. Now, there is a free parcel you can get okay. today, but that is updated. It's not, very, uh, not updated that often. We have a final question for Travis. Or should we wrap up there? I think we'll wrap up there. So, right. Travis, you're going to be around. Uh, I'll be around, there, absolutely. I'll be around.